All right, Leviticus 23:42. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. And that seven days in all actuality really speaks to all your life. In all actuality. And it said, all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. And I just want you to know and understand that we all dwell in booths. These bodies that we have, they are nothing but temporary dwelling places. They are no different than those tents that they were staying out in in the wilderness. You know, so I want you to understand that, you know, as Israel traveled through the wilderness and all those stations that they made um, along the way, that they stopped at along the way, if we are to travel the way of Yahuwah, then we have to travel the same route. You know, because, uh, you know, the way doesn't change. The way does not change. We all have to have a wilderness experience. We all must dwell in booths. Okay? And so that's what this uh, series, you know, is all about. Now, we done went through a number of stations, and we're going to go through a number of stations today. And we're very close to the end. You know, so let's see what scripture has to teach us. Because, you know, this is a very important time because in, in many respects it can speak to our day and time because we know that we are very close to the end. Amen. We know we are very close to the end of Yah's plan. You know, in fact, there hasn't been a people on the planet historically that has been closer to the end of Yah's plan than we today. And tomorrow, we're going to be even closer. So, you know, that's very pertinent and very, uh, very good news. You know, because a lot of awesome things happen at the end. You know, some of them good, some of them bad. But that's all throughout, you know, because the eyes just. Amen? Yeah. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, we're going to pick it up from Numbers 21, 10. So can I have my first reader read Numbers 21, 10 through 13, please? And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Obo. 11. And they, they journeyed from Obo and pitched at Yariabim, or Jabarim, in the wilderness, which is before Moab, towards the sun rising. 12. For thence they removed and pitched in the valley of Zared. 13, from thence they removed and pitched on the other side of Arden, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coast of the Amorites. And Aran, Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, we're gonna take a look at, uh, at some of the uh, meanings of these places. You know, uh, so it tells us that Israel set forward and they pitched in a boat, um, which speaks to um, bottles or desires or holes dug for water, okay? And it speaks of them journeying on from there to Yabarim, you know, number 5863, um, speaking to ruins of the pastors, you know, or um, uh, from a root word meaning a crossover. You know, so uh, I guess this is a dangerous junction, you know, because it ruins the passage, you know. And it says it's before Moab. Moab uh, means of his father. Then we have in verse 12, it spoke that they moved from there and they pitched in the valley of Zared, you know. And Zared means to be exuberant in growth. So, you know, even though they were in the valley, you know, they were exuberant in growth. Sometimes you can get a, into a low spot in your life, but still experience exuberant growth. Amen? Amen. You know, uh, verse 13 spoke of Israel removing from there and pitching on the other side of Arnon. Arnon speaking to a brawling stream, you know, to, to uh, from the root to shout for joy. So it's a stream that they were very joyful to see, probably because they were very thirsty because they was traveling through a wilderness, mm -hmm. through a desert, right? Yeah. You know, so uh, any water you see, you probably shouting for joy. But even more so when they got to this one. You know, and it speaks about our not being betwixt the border of Moab and the Amorites. Amorites speaks to, it's an interesting word, actually. It speaks to a, uh, a mountaineer. So these people are lofty. You know, they're, they're, they're prideful, proudful uh, people. They're also sayers. You know, it says in the sense of um, um, pl ah, publicity. Yeah. You know, so 
you know, so a sayer in a sense of publicity, you know, um, you put that together, what you get? Public sayer or public speaker. Amen? You know, so I thought that was pretty interesting. I guess I was the only one. Huh? But, <laughs> but anyway, we're going to continue on verses 14 through 17. Um, it says, Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of Yahuwah, what he did in the Red Sea and in the in the brooks of Arnon and at the stream of the brooks that go up down to the dwelling of, of Ar and lie up upon the border of Moab. Ar speaking to a city means a city. You know, the city called a city. Where are you going? Going to the city. All right. All right. Uh, verse 16. And from thence they went to Be'er. That is the well whereof Yahuwah spake unto Moshe. Gather the people together and I will give them water. Now Be'er is number 876. It speaks to a pit or a well. It's from by our meaning to declare or expound. And see, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, drinking water, well water, drinking water, speaks to counsel. Because the very root of the word air means to declare or expound. You know, not to mention, um, you know, it also uh, speaks to how one would write, which was, well, never mind. It speaks to that. Um, it says it is used. It was used to describe Moshe's oral exposition of the Torah given at Sinai. You know, and this is where he would expound on it, of course. Now, Numbers twenty one seventeen says, "Then Israel sang this song: Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it." Now, these four words, "sing ye unto it," is ana. You know, number sixty thirty meaning to I, to heed, to pay attention to. You know, and so. You know, you have to be cognizant of these word pictures because these word pictures gives us much, much more insight into what's being um, told. You know, you know, um, Hebrew is a pictorial language, you know, and it speaks with word pictures. And Yah uses scripture to paint word pictures. Even the lettering themselves were word pictures, but each letter had its own distinct meaning. You know, and so uh, that's why you always hear me talking about the picture and trying to get you to see the picture. Because there's so many things in a picture that you can't really describe it all in, in, at, at one time sometimes because there's so many facets to it. And it just depends on, you know, how far you zoom in or zoom out, you know, as, um, you know, as to what you'll see. Some pictures you can't see unless you zoom out and look at it from a hole. Other pictures you can't see unless you zoom in and really focus. And then you begin to see, oh, there's pictures in the pictures. How cool. You know, well, that's how Hebrew is. You know, so I want you to understand that because we're going to pull out some of those pictures today. And they're, they're kind of far from the traditional interpretation of things. Nevertheless, they are there. They are not inaccurate in any stretch of the imagination because, you know, the grounding um, uh, for them is all there. It's there. It's just, you know, chosen to be looked over and a different interpretation to be expounded upon. And that's because sometimes the picture doesn't make sense to the person that's looking at it because of the time in which they're looking at it. If you understand what I'm saying, you know, um, you know, like Yahshua being the light, he came, he told us he was the light, you know, but prior to that, you know, when you read about light, you know, you, you don't equate it to Yahshua. The people who read about it prior to Yahshua didn't equate it to Yahshua. Like we, we learned from the brick kind of shower in the New Testament that Yahshua is the word. But prior to that, you know, we don't relate the word to Yahshua. You know, and so the people who had it, you know, they wasn't relating it to Yahshua. We learned from Brick Hashad that, you know, Yahshua is the Alatah. Prior to that, people seen the Alatah, they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't relate it to Yahshua because he had not yet came and explained that he was the Alatah. Right, right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, so some things can be there, but the people couldn't see it because the timing wasn't right. Yeah. You know, but then we come along in the latter days, and we have the whole of the word, you know, and so we can relate to these things where they, where their original interpreters couldn't. Right. 
So, you know, that makes a big difference, you know. So, uh, now, that said, and then sometimes, you know, it would make totally no sense to, the, to an earlier person, but then make perfect sense to people later on. Like, if you read about something about fish, you know, and a fishery, and, you know, and then you start relating it to Yahshua and him being, make, going to find all these fishers and making them fishers of men, yeah. you know, stuff start clicking. Yeah. You know, but prior to that, you just, you know, people of the, of the ancients, they just seemed, you know, they were thinking literal fish. You know, so totally different. All right, so I spent enough time on that. Let's, let's keep it moving. So um, now a point that I want to bring out, you know, that I think is important, and that is to know that Yah was providing this well um, unsolicited. Did you catch that? He was providing this well unsolicited and that maybe this is a way that Israel had grown in Zared. Remember Zared meant exuberant growth. The valley of um, Zared uh, spoke to exuberant growth. Yeah. Now, whatever the case, Israel, you know, take note, they're not complaining or murmuring. Mm. Yeah. But they were waiting patiently on Yah. Yeah. See, they were happy, you know, when Yah said he was going to give them a well so that they can have some water. That's because they were thirsty because they was walking through a wilderness. They were walking through a desert, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and so, of course, they, they're, they're thirsty and they want water, you know, yet they're not complaining and they're not murmuring. Now, remember, all the weeks prior, they were complaining and they were murmuring. They was getting in trouble for it. Yeah. So it seems as though they finally kind of, you know, learned their lesson. And here it is. You know, they're not complaining. They're not murmuring. And Yah is providing this well of water totally unsolicited. Not because they're complaining and murmuring, but because he knows that his children are thirsty and he's providing it for them as he would have even in the other times had they not been complaining and murmuring. And they wouldn't have got in trouble. So it seems as though they're, they're learning. Can you see that? Yes. And I pray you can see that because if you can't see it in their lives, then you won't be able to see it in yours. Mm -hmm. So I pray you can see it. Okay, so... Um, Numbers 21, 18, it says, The princes digged the well, the nobles of the people digged it, by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves, and from the wilderness, and from the wilderness they went to Matanah. Okay, so, first of all, you know, God, he's going to provide them with this well, right? He, 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 tells, he tells Moshe, he says, you know, uh, gather the people together, I will give them water. Okay, so Moshe gathered them together. The people started singing. And Yah has Moshe to tell them, you know, the princes and the nobles are to dig it. Now, this word princess is sar, number 62, um, 6269, meaning a ruler or a leader. This is important because it's the rulers and leaders that has to dig the well. You know, what is this word dig? It's kafar. Um, that's this, this first dig. It's kafar. Number 2658, meaning to pry into, by implication to delve, to explore. See, and this is what we are to do, you know, uh, with the word. We're to pry into it. We're to delve into it. Us leaders, we're to explore it. Explore it, you know. And it says, the nobles of the people dig. Now, this word nobles is not D, number 5081, and it means an inclined volunteer. So this is one who volunteers. Yah has giving them the inclination, you know, to volunteer, and so that's what they've done in they, their digging, right? Yeah. And it says in this, by direction of the lawgiver, which uh, um, these six words is taken from the Hebrew word karkak, number 27, 10, meaning to be a scribe, you know, and a scribe, of course, is the one who write the word, you know, and it says they dig. Now, that, that word dig is actually a different word, dig. You know, I mean, you never would have thought. You look reading it in English, you see dig, and, and you see dig, and you think, okay, it's the same word. No, it's not. Not in the Hebrew. It's uh, kara, number 37, um, 38, meaning to dig. You know, so it doesn't mean to dig, whereas the other one means to pry into, to delve, to explore. You know, so a, a bit of difference. You know, and it says, and they went from the wilderness, and they went to Matana. Matana means the gift of Yah. See, and that's what happens when you dig. When you dig into his word, you pry into his word, you explore it, you delve into it, you know, um, eventually you will get a gift of Yah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and it says in verse 19, and from Montanah to Nahaliel, and from Nahaliel to Baroth. Nahaliel, um, this number 5160, it speaks to the Valley of El. I mean, that's a great place to be, um, in the Valley of El. Anywhere El is, I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, Baroth, number 1120, you know, speaks to the high places of Baal. Uh, that place don't sound too great, you know. And um, Numbers 21, 20, and from Bamoth into the valley that is in the country of Moab to the top of Pisgah. Pisgah speaks to a cleft or a fortress or eminence, you know, and which look up toward Yeshimon. Yeshimon speaks to a wilderness, a desolation, okay? All right, so... Moving right along. Um, numbers 21, 21 through 24, my next reader, please. And Israel sent messengers unto Sheha, king of the Amalek, saying, Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of this well, but we will go along by the king's highway until we be passed thy borders. Hallelujah. Okay, so um, and I'm sorry, I okay. thought you were done. No, not yet. And Shehab, and Shehab would not suffer Israel to pass through his border, but Shehab gathered all the people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness and he came to Jehaz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword, and successed his land, possessed his land from Aaron unto Jabbok, even unto the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. Hallelujah. Okay. So verse 21 speaks about Israel sending messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of these lofty ones, these prideful ones. Mm -hmm. Sihon, his name means warrior, so you can you can guess what he was, you know. Um, so he was a war, he was the warrior of the Amorites, mm -hmm. of the um, the uh, the sayers, you know, uh, the public sayers, if you would, you know. Now, Israel was very polite. The people of Yah, we are called to be polite. They asked. They said, let us pass through the land. Not only that, they said, we will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well, but we will go along by the king's highway until we be past thy borders. Like, we don't want no trouble. Right? But, Sihon, being the warrior that he was, wasn't going for that. And it says, he would not suffer Israel to pass through his border. Not only that, he gathered up his people and went out against them. And he come and he picking fights. You know, and he came to, to, um, to Yahaz. Yeah, I know, right? And he came to Yahaz, which means to stamp, to try and down, to curl a dispute. So here it is, you know, Israel, I, I pray you see yourself. You know, here it is. There's going to be times when you're going to be traveling and you're just going to be, you know, trying to be polite and folks just gonna pick fights with you. Yeah. They're gonna come and try to stamp on you, try you down. They're gonna quarrel and dispute with you. Amen? Amen. You know, um, now verse 24 says, Israel smote him with the edge of the sword. And see, and that's just what we're supposed to do. You know, when these type folks come up against us, you know, and here it is, we're trying to be polite and we're trying to, just trying to go about our way, you know, they come up against us, we're to smote them with the edge of the sword. Now, we know the sword speaks to the word of Elohim. Amen? Amen. So I don't want you to go out and say, you know, Pastor Obadiah told me to cut you. No. Um, you know, we're to use the word of Elohim. I don't want you to pull out no physical swords and swing it at nobody. You know, the sword is a spiritual sword. It represents the word of Elohim. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's what we do with our fight. We fight not against flesh and blood, right? Right. Okay, so... It says, and he pos they possessed his land from Arnon to Yabuk, you know, even the two of even unto the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. Now the border of the children of Ammon was strong. They wasn't messing with that. They was they was real strong, 
you know. And so your book means a point for for emptying evacuation. So in other words, here it is, you know, they were evicting them. They were evacuating them, you know, and they were pouring forth up out of there. You know, Amnon, you know, speaks to uh, a people, speaks to being inbred, because it was one of the children of, uh, of Lot, which were inbred. All right. Moving right along, Numbers 21, 25 through 29 says, And Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites in Heshbon, and in the villages thereof. Now, Heshbon speaks to a stronghold. It also can speak to invention or industry. You know, now, verse 26. For Hezbron was the city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon. You know, so Sihon, you know, he was he was he was a bit of a um, he was he was that guy, you know, he was a you know kind of a bully too, you know, because you know he, he went and took up somebody else's land, said he fought against the former king of Moab and taking all his land out of his hand, even unto Arnon, and now here it is, Yah having him take it from him. You know, having Israel take it from him. And verse 27 it says, Wherefore they speak in Proverbs, saying, Come into Heshbon, let the city of Sihon be built and prepared, for there is a fire going out of Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sihon. It hath consumed Ar of Moab and the lords so of the high places of Arnon. Woe to thee, Moab! Thou art undone, O people of Chemosh. He hath given his sons that escaped and his daughters into captivity unto Sihon, king of the Amorites. So this is the saying that was going around, you know, because uh, King Sihon had done this. You know, Chemos speaks to, to subdue or handling, stroking or taking away, okay? All right, verses 30 through 32, we have not, we have shot at them. Hesbon is perished, even unto Debon, and we have laid them waste even to Nophi, which reacheth unto Medaba. Heshbon, number 2809 in the strong, speaks to a stronghold again, or invention, or industry. You know, um, Debon, number 1769, speaks to pining or wasting. It also can speak to an abundance of knowledge. Nophi, a gust or blast, fearful, binding. You know, uh, Medaba, Number 4311, water of quiet or rest, waters of grief, water springing up, okay? Um, verse 31 and 32, thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites, and Moshe sent to spy out Yaazir, and they took the villages thereof, and they drove out the Amorites that were there. Yaazir means to be helpful or helped. Okay, now, I know this sounds just like a bunch of History, a bunch of names of places, right? You know, but there's an alternative interpretation of this passage that that you know really spoke to me. I pray it speak to you. Now, the picture is definitely there, you know, and it can definitely be be um be interpreted in this fashion, even though you don't read it in your Bibles in this fashion. Nevertheless, it is there. I I assure you. And this alternative way of interpreting this passage is that Israel taught themselves the skills of, public, of the public speaking industry. Went into that industry, dominated, destroyed his king, took his abundance of knowledge, and made other public speakers fearful to stay in the industry until there was no more resistance. Hence they resided there and sent out spies to find out if any tried to help any other Amorites or other public speakers and drove them out as well. You know, and, you know, I was thinking about this. I, you know, I seen this picture, you know, and I'm like, wow, this is, this is amazing that this is just, that this is here. That, you know, um, that this can actually be interpreted in this fashion. And I'm like, you know, trying to, you know, make heads or tails out of it, you know. And, you know, it's really incredible when you think about it, you know, because, you know, Israel actually should be public speakers. Because we should be the ones out there talking about and telling telling the public about our L. We should be the ones that, that's going around and promoting the gospel of our Messiah, Yahshua, you know, and telling people how this walk really looks like. 
and telling people, encouraging people to walk in the way of Yahuwah, yeah. you know, in spirit and in truth, yeah. you know, and speaking righteously, you know. And so, you know, I got to contemplating that, you know, and I, I got to just thinking about it and, and just in general, you know, what if Yah's people just, you know, truly rose up and took this industry by storm? You know, and, you know, and, you know, most of the uh, public speakers that you, you, you find, you know, began to be Israelites, began to be servants of the Most High El. You know, we would make the best motivational speakers because, you know, what's more motivational than letting someone know that all their sins can be forgiven and they can get, be given a, a renewed opportunity to life? doesn't get any more motivational than that does it yeah. you know and you know what about you know telling people how they can go how they can be blessed yeah. you know not by naming it and claiming it but by walking in righteousness yeah. you know and showing them all the promises that the word has in store for those who do so yeah. and how Yah promises to to be at their side and to bring them through all calamities and, and, and show them in the word where he's done it before and how he's planning on doing it again. Yeah. 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 We would have plenty of material to speak about, wouldn't we? Yep. Yeah. Be a awesome, a awesome thing. Yeah. You know, so you know, I got to thinking about this and I'm like, man, that, that would be a great, you know, industry for Yas people. You know, and I, I also got to thinking about how other ethnic groups control certain industries. You know, I remember when I uh, when I was in the car industry. You know, uh, when I had a I had a used car lot, and the um, Italians they pretty much control the used car industry. You know, and you know many of the um, the big the big uh, auction houses they were owned by Italians. You know, and so you know you you start looking at like hair. You know, Chinese, they pretty much dominate that industry. Nails, Koreans, they pretty much dominate that industry. You know, and, and it just goes, it goes on and on and on. You know, you have different ethnic groups that dominate different industries. So which industry does Yah's people dominate? Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem right there, you know. But, you know, there should be something that, you know, when you think of that industry, oh, that's Yah's people, uh, the Israelites, them ones that's, that's going through life wrestling with good and evil and prevailing by holding on to yeah. Elohim. Yeah, that's, that's their area. Don't even think about going into that unless you're right. going to think about joining them. You see what I mean? Yeah. You know, that's the way it should be. You know, um, but, you know, I just thought it was just Yasun that an alternative interpretation of this passage is that Israel taught themselves the skills of public speaking, of the public speaking industry. But it could be of any other industry. Went into that industry, dominated it, destroyed its king, took the abundance of knowledge, and made other um, skillful people in that industry um, fearful to even stay in the industry. Until there was no more resistance. And then, you know, even sent out spies to find out if anyone was trying to help them and drove them out as well. That sounded like a hostile takeover to me. <laughs> you know? Which is what it was then and what it can be now. Say a lot. Okay, so Numbers 21, 33 through 35, it says, And they turned and went by the way up of Bashan. You know, okay, now, so here it is. You have Israel. They done went through their little thing. You know, they're going through their um, their different stations. And so Sihon came out against them. They just was trying to go through his land. They picked a fight with him. They lost. You know, they went into their industry, destroyed it, um, destroyed them, took over their industry, and now, you know, to the point to where they, they were at a place of quietness. You know, and so, you know, now they're beginning to rise up. You know, it says they, um, Numbers 30, 21, 33 says, and they turned and went by the way of Bashan, and all, the king of Bashan went out against them, and he and all his people to battle at Edri. Now, you're not told here, but I'm going to tell you, you know, remember, 
where where it told us it said uh where did it go um right here in, in verse 24 it says for the border of the children of Amnon was strong so they stopped at, at Yabuk mm -hmm. okay this is where all comes from you know he was the king of the Ammonites of some of the Ammonites okay and so you know he's seeing all this and, and he decides he's gonna you know they turned and went up by the way of Bashan and it's not saying that they were going to attack him or anything but all the king of Bashan went out against them he and all his people to the battle of Idri okay now Bashan means fruitful so now in the larger scope of things when you think about the picture that scripture is painting you have the um, Israelites who finally have an industry you know and they they quiet quieted the, all the turmoil and the fighting in the industry, you know, and now they begin to rise up towards the way of becoming fruitful. See, because you can go in and you can take over an industry, right? You know, uh, but it's still going to take some time before you become fruitful in that particular industry. You know, because you have to recoup your initial investment, right? You know, so it says they turn by the way of Bashan, and um, Bashan, meaning fruitful, Og spoke to a giant. Um, his name literally means long neck. Um, speaks with cake, uh, bread baked in ashes. You know, now Idri speaks to mightier strength. You know, uh, verse 34, and Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand. Hallelujah. You know, um, so, you know, we don't have anything to fear as long as Yah is with us. That's right. It says, and all his people and his land, and thou shalt do to him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him and his sons and all his people until there was none left him uh, none left him alive, and they possessed his land. Now, an alternative way of interpreting this passage speaks to Israel finally beginning to rise up in the land. They're starting to come into fruitfulness, that is, see, seeing the fruit of their labors when they are attacked by the giant Og of Bashan, of the Amorites, you know. And so, you know, I want you to take heed to this because this actually happens in life. You know, for those of you who have been around long enough to, to live life a bit, I'm sure you've seen this pattern. You know, you've gotten into something and, you know, it was a struggle getting into it. You finally, you know, feel like you overcame those struggles and you... You, you firm, you're firmly in it, and now you're beginning to prosper. You know, you're starting to become fruitful, and here comes something else. I'm sure some of you have experienced that. You know, well, that's just another form of Og, oh, the king of Bashan, the king of fruitfulness, coming up against Yah's people. But you have something to rejoice about, because in 2134, Yah says, fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand. Hallelujah. So we can overcome our enemies. You know, and so this is to be encouragement to any and all of us who are going through something, you know, who've struggled to, to finally get settled into something, and now something's keeping you from prospering. Something's keeping you right when you should be bearing fruit. You know, you're finding yourself struggling. And that's because... The king of fruitfulness is coming up against you. But Yah will give you the victory. But you have to hold on to him. Amen? Numbers 22, 1 through 3. And the children of Israel set forth and pitched in the plains of Moab. On this side of Jordan by Jericho. Uh, Jordan speaking to a descendant. Jericho speaking to a moon or its moon. Um, verse 2. And Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Okay, now, uh, Balak was the king of Moab. All right? <clears throat> Matter of fact, verse 3 says, And Moab was sore afraid. See, it's using Balak and Moab interchangeably. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. Okay, so, um, Balak means a devastator. Zippor speaks to a bird as hopping or departing. You know, it comes from the root Zephar, meaning to leave or depart. So you, you kind of see, you know, one leaving or departing, um, hopping leave, while they're leaving. You know, now that, you know, that actually has great significance, but I, I can't go there. But anyway, um, say what? 
What? Okay, let me keep going. All right. All right. Hallelujah. All right, so was so afraid. Was so afraid. You know, in verse 3 it says, Moab was so afraid, was so, so afraid is gore. Number 1481 means to turn aside from the road. Me, it comes from, um, it's a compound word from um, gore and meold. You know, meold is number 3966 meaning with strong passion or vehemence. Vehemence. Whatever. Strong passion. All right. So, was so afraid. So, here it is. You know, we have Balak. You know, he's he's the king of Moab, and he's seeing you know Israel. They come, they come, and they they settle in the plains of Moab. You know, and they're just sitting there. Now imagine this. Now you're the king of Moab. You know, here it is. This huge group of people come right in your plains right before you. You know, and they just sit there. They're not saying nothing. You know, um, and you know he's kind of flipping out. You know, because they're not saying nothing. So I want you to kind of, you know, get this picture in your head so you can see the picture. Now, Numbers 22, 4 through 7, my next reader, please. And, Mo and Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zipporah, was king of the, the Moabites at the time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover their, the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Pray Preadventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I want, for I want that he, he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination, and they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these terms. Um, we have Balaam. And, you know, uh, his name uh, means not of the people. You know, we have Beor, which speaks to a burning or a light. Pethor, soothsayer. Kasa, meaning to cover, means to plump or fill up, means to cover or conceal, um, even to protect. Face, and I, I found this interesting. See, stuff like this is always like a, a remez. A remez is like a, um, a hint or a clue. You know, it kind of sticks out. You know, so here it is. Face, you know, um, is ayin, number 5869, meaning the eye. Now, normally face in the Hebrew is panah, or some derivative thereof. Usually, it's not translated from ayin, you know, speaking to the eye. You know, and so, you know, that, that's, that stood out, you know, and against, you know, meaning abruptly in front of. So the picture that's being painted here is, you know, Moab, you know, speaking to Midian, speaking, you know, Midian, Midian means strife, by the way. Um, Midian means strife. And so here it is, you have Moab, these, these folks that are other father, you know, and speaking to those of strife, and they... You know, they had this come, they, they're telling them, you know, hey, you see all these people out here? You know, and so they send messages to uh, Balaam, who's not of the people, you know, but he's a son of light, you know, and he lives where the soothsayers are. So I'm taking he's a soothsayer, you know, which uh, was an old word for prophet. And we're talking about, you know, um, these people who are covering the face of the earth. They're covering the eye. I typify, you know, light and understanding. So they're covering the light and understanding, you know, of the land, you know, against that is sitting abruptly in front of Moab. And so they're making him nervous. They're there, they're not saying anything, and he's getting a little disgruntled. And so he says in verse 6, Come now, therefore, I pray thee, 
curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. He know they too mighty for him because Sihon is the one who took the cities from him and they whooped Sihon. Mm -hmm. And then the one who was really strong, all, they whooped him too. <laughs> so Moab not even thinking about coming out and fighting them because they already know they can't win. You know, so you have to understand the dynamics of the um, picture as well. Okay, verse 7, and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination. So they know they can't beat them physically, so they're going to try to beat them spiritually. Now, this is very important, um, children of Elohim. Because if the world can't beat you physically, they will try to whoop you spiritually. So this is very important. You got to get this lesson right here. This is this is an important one. verses eight through twelve of Numbers twenty-two. Um, it says, and he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as Yahuwah shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam, and Elohim came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto Elohim, Balak. The son of Zippor, king of Moab, have sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Mizraim, which cover up the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And Elohim said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. You know, so first thing I want to point out is, don't worry about nobody cursing you if you're on top of your square. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, there's not a devil in Hades that can come up against you. You know, if y'all deem you blessed, you are blessed and can't no one curse you. You know, now Numbers 22, 1 through 12, we can gather an alternative interpretation from this um, section as well. And it speaks to a people coming out of Yahuda, that is the praisers of Yah, which will cover, that is protect the light and understanding of the earth. Now I want, I want you to understand that those, those of us who are the praisers of Yah, it is our responsibility to cover, that is to protect the light and understanding yeah. of the earth. Yeah. The light and understanding of the earth is scripture. And so it's our job to protect scripture, you know, and the proper understanding of it. Amen? And that's why we should be in the public speaking business, because there's many people who are doing damage to the word of Elohim. Amen? But those who are of their fathers, if you don't know who, who that refers to, then ask Yahshua. You know, and you know, um, Yahshua is the word, so if you don't know, ask the word. It's in there. Just... Look for who Yahshua spoke about saying that they were of their fathers. Mm. But those who are of their father will team up with Midian, will team up with strife, and seek to fight against you, but not physically, but spiritually, via cursing. Mm. But not to worry, Israel, for it won't work, for you can't curse whom Yah is blessed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not to say there isn't a way. And we're about to find out that way. You know, you can let them knock you off your square. If you let them knock you off your square, that is, if you, if you let them somehow deceive you or trick you into doing things that Yah has told you not to do, then his protection will no longer cover you. You will be open in that area of your life, and in that area of your life, you can be cursed. And this, the enemy can come in and attack you. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. And, um, you know, and it won't even really be the enemy attacking you. It'll be Yah that's plaguing you. Yes. Because you're supposed to be his. Right. Amen? Amen? You're supposed to be loving him. And the way we love him is by doing what he says do. Right. And when we cease to do that, we open up a doorway, a hole, a gap for the enemy to come in. You understand? Yeah. You know, so, you know, now, I pray you understand that. If you don't, I pray you understand it after this because we're about to see an example of that happening. See, it's no, it's not by chance that Yah, that scripture gives us this. It's painting this picture for us that they're about to be attacked spiritually, you know, um, and now it's going to show us their spiritual attack. Okay, so we're going on to the next verse, which is actually in chapter 25, Numbers 
um, 25, 1 through 3, it says, And Israel abode in, in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of Yahuwah was kindled against Israel. Now they got the one who's supposed to be protecting them upset with them. That's not good. That's never good. Okay, now let's break this down a bit. It says, in Israel abode in Shittim. Shittim is number 7851. It speaks to the Acacias. Now, I want you to know that, that this is a symbol of holiness because it's, the, it's from Acacia wood that the tabernacle and all its supports and all its furniture is made from Acacia wood. Right. You know, and so this is a symbol of holiness. So it's it's. Uh, what the scripture is painting a picture for us, it's painting us a picture of Israel abiding in holiness. And see, as long as they were abiding in holiness, they could not be touched. As long as they were abiding in holiness, they could not become cursed. See, and so this is what Balaam, you know, eventually taught them that they couldn't be cursed because they were in right standing with their Elohim. But if you get them out of right standing with their Elohim, then they can be cursed. Right. And so this is how they've done it. They sent the daughters of Moab. Mm -hmm. They sent their women over there right. to entice Israel. Listen up, men of Israel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, yeah. listen up. Yeah. Learn how the enemy works against us. Yeah. They sent the daughters of Moab, the daughters of those who are of their father. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it says they began. This word, they began to commit whoredom. This word began as kalal. It means not to start. No. It means to profane to defile, to pollute, to, to desecrate. Mm -hmm. You know, so the people profaned themselves. They defiled themselves. They were living, abiding in holiness, and they started to profane and defile, to pollute and desecrate themselves. Can you see? Can, do you understand? You know, and it says to commit whoredom. To commit whoredom is zana, meaning to fornicate, to prostitute. Mm -hmm. They began to cheat on their husband. Symbolically speaking. Israel was married to Elohim, right? It says, it's telling us that they're fornicating, they're prostituting themselves. They're basically cheating on their husband. They're cheating on Yah. It tells us in the next verse, and they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow themselves to their gods. Can you see that they're submitting and giving themselves yeah. to other gods? Right. They're cheating on Yah. Right. This is a type of spiritual fornication. You know, it says, and they call the people into the sacrifices of their gods. And you have to be careful because people will call you unto the sacrifices of their gods. Mm. You know, now, Yah has his holy days with that he calls Moedim. This is the point of time. Mm -hmm. You know, and the world has their holidays, mm -hmm. which is based on the same thing. Amen. I'm just saying, what if they were actually sacrificing to other gods? Mm -hmm. Because they're not sacrificing to Yahuwah Elohim, right. because you can't sacrifice to Yahuwah Elohim your way. Right. You can only sacrifice to Yahuwah Elohim his way. He's at L of specificity. You can't do it your way. You have to do it the way he prescribed. Otherwise, you're not doing it unto him. And see, and we know this because this is this is how this is what the Messiah was speaking to when he said, Many shall come in that day saying, Adonai, Adonai, you know, did I not cast out devils in your name and do all these wonderful works in your name? And he said, Go away, for I never knew you. What, what, what do you mean? I, you never knew me. I was casting out these things and doing all this stuff in your name. I never knew you. But but I was doing these things in your name. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. See, you have to understand, if, you, if you're not serving Yah the way that he prescribed, then you're not serving Yah. You may be serving somebody, but it's not Yah. You know, and so it says, they called the people into their sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. Bowed down to Shakar, meaning to depress, that is to prostrate to reverence, to worship, you know. So you see, 
you can't straddle the fence. You can't serve Yah and another guy. And one of the first things he told them is that I am Yahuwah and I'm a jealous hell. Right? That was one of the first things he told them. Now, verse 3 says, And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. This word, joined, these two words, joined himself, is taken from the one Hebrew word, um, zamad, meaning to gird, bind, join, fasten. They connected themselves with Baal Peor. I want you to know and understand that when you do these things, when you submit yourself to the authority of another God, when you bow down before them, whether knowingly or unknowingly, you actually join yourselves unto them. You know, and it says they joined themselves unto Baal Peor. Baal Peor means Lord of the Gap or Lord of the Opening. So I want you to understand that because this is how the enemy works. You know, the Lord of the Opening seeks to make an opening in your holiness. And wherever that opening in your holiness is, that's where he would join himself to you. And when he does that, that will cause you to submit yourself to him and you'll commit fornication and Yah will be upset with you. Hence we see and the anger of Yahuwah was kindled against Israel. So you have to understand that. You know, this is how you get in trouble. This is how you, you get holes in your holiness. Your holiness is kind of like your force field. It's like your armor. You know, when you think about the, the um, spiritual armor, it is nothing but holiness. You know, the breath, um, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword, which is the word, having your um, yourself gird with truth, the feet shot with the gospel. It's all holiness. You get a hole in your holiness, you know, that's where you get attacked. That's where you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Let me have a next reader read um, Numbers 25, 4 through 9, please. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before Yahuwah against the sun, that the fierce anger of Yahuwah may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and went after the men of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel, and the woman to her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. The Hebrew actually says the stake went through his, the pelvis. So in other words, the punishment fit the crime. Hallelujah. According to the Hebrew. <laughs> oh, one more verse. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Hallelujah. All right, so... I don't know about you guys, but when I first read this, I was so taken aback. You know, I was like the nerve of this guy. You know, but it says, Yahuwah said unto Moshe, take all the heads of the people. See, because it's the heads of the people who are responsible. You know, see, that's why judgment begins with, with the, um, with the uh, ecclesia. It begins with the church. It begins with the heads of the people. Yahuwah said, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before Yahuwah against the sun. That the fierce anger of Yahuwah may be turned away from Israel. See, because he started plaguing them. Mm -hmm. See, this is how plagues come into people's lives and they don't even realize it. It says, And, and um, slay ye everyone his men that were joined to Baal Peor. See, when you find that, now you, you have to remember that Yah looked at Israel as one man. Right? So this can pertain to any one of us as an individual. And it can pertain to all of us as a corporate body. You know, but on an individual scale, you know, you have to understand that there can be parts of your life that are attached to other gods. You understand that? There can be parts of your life 
that can be attached to other guys. And they will cause you to become cursed. And you can be plagued because of it. Now, the way you get out of it, once it is known and once it's done, come to the forefront, then you have to take the heads that's responsible. Mm -hmm. You have to get rid of them. You know, so maybe it's a friend in your life. You know, that's a bad influence. That's causing you to, to get in this type of trouble. You got to cut them off. You know, it says that the fierce anger of Yahuwah may be turned away. And it says, um, in verse 6, it says, One of the children of Israel brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman. Mm -hmm. That is a woman of strife. Because Midian means strife. So this is a strifeful woman in the sight of Moshe and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door. Now here it is, they're weeping, you know, they're, they're, they're repentful, you know, and they're trying to get right. And here it is, you know, this strifeful woman come right in the midst of them. And this guy, you know, of Israel right in the midst of them. How much nerve is that? The enemy is bold. Mm -hmm. Verse 7 said, And when Phinehas, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, when he saw it, he took his javelin in his hand, and he went he went uh, after the man of Israel into the tent mm -hmm. and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed. This is how you stay the plague. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is the picture within the picture. Is the picture behind some of this stuff. Phineas, first of all, his name means mouth of a serpent. You know, and I know a lot of people, they see that and they say, mouth of a serpent, oh, that's something bad. See, but you got to remember the lesson from last week. Remember, serpents are just a type of angelic being. Remember, our Messiah, Yahshua, said he must be lifted up even as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. I mean, likening himself to that serpent that was lifted up, that when the people were bit by the serpents, and they looked unto him, they were healed. Amen? Amen. So all serpents aren't bad serpents. Amen? Amen? It's just a type of being. Yeah. Now there is the, the, the um, Satan, who, who is also called the serpent of old. Now we know he bad. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but in Isaiah 6, it speaks about the seraphim, who was serpent type beings, you know, before the throne of Elohim. I don't think they were bad. Mm. Amen? You know, so you got to think these things through. Okay, so Phineas, mouth of a serpent. Tent, you know, is um, translated as pavilion from Kabob, number 6895, uh, meaning to scoop out, meaning to stab with words. One of his meanings is to stab with words. You know, and belly also stems from that same root, meaning to stab with words. You know, so you see the scriptures painting a picture of... Uh, the mouth of, serp, uh, of a serpent stabbing the enemy with words. That sounds crazy, don't it? Not when you think of the brick kind of shot. Not when you think of Yahshua, you know, in Revelations when he's talking about he's going to come um, and he's going to destroy him with the sword of his mouth. Think you can have someone with words? Yeah. Not when you. It's not crazy when you consider that the word of Elohim is like a sword. Mm -hmm. Can you stab someone with words? Yeah. See, we fight not against flesh and blood. So, <clears throat> you know, if we're going to yield a sword, how are we going to do it? What is it going to look like? We're going to be stabbing folks with words. Yeah. This is what Phineas did. This is the spiritual picture behind what he did. See, even though he done it physically, we're to do it spiritually. Yeah. Now, this wasn't for them. So when they seen this interpretation in the word, they would have never interpreted it in this fashion. Because they were fighting flesh and blood. But we fight not against flesh and blood. So we can't take it in this capacity. Because Yahshua taught us to be wise as a serpent, yet gentle as a dove. Yeah. Amen? Amen? You know, so we can't take it in the physical and say, okay, I got to get my javelin and be ready. No. 
We have to do it spiritually. We have to stab with words. You know, and so the plague had started amongst the people, and it says, and those that died in the plague were 20 and 4 thousand. That's a lot of people. Yeah. That's a lot of people. That's the uh, largest amount of people that God destroyed out of Israel at one time that, that, that I can recall, you know, in this wilderness experience. You know, the, uh, when Korah rebelled, you know, that was a big one, but that was only 14,000. You know, 24,000. 24 is the number of priesthood, too. Say a lot. Verses 10 through 13, and Yahuwah spake unto Moshe, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, have turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake. Among them that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Zealous is kana, meaning to make, to be or make jealous or envious. Wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. Peace is shalom, number 7965. Number um, 2513, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his Elohim and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Um, and it speaks about giving them this covenant of peace, which is reminding me of uh, Matthew Yahoo 5 9 said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of Elohim. Hallelujah. Verses 14 and 15. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house of the Simeonites. The name of the Midianitish woman was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was the head of a people and a chief of a chief house of Midian. Now this is huge. You know, it says Zimri is musical. Zimri means musical. It's from Zalmar, meaning to trim or prune. Salu means wave, you know, um, from the root to hang up or wave. Also, figuratively, we can speak to contempt, tread down um, value. Simeonites, those hearing. Colesby, false. From Kazab, meaning to lie or deceive. And Zur means rock. So the picture that scripture is painting is that of music which was trimmed or pruned. It was being mixed with lies and deception of another God and is being played in the very midst of the camp of Israel, thereby causing Israel to be played. That's huge. You know, that's huge, especially when you, when you, start, when you start thinking about, when you start considering what they do with music today. How they trim and prune parts of secular songs that truly was, you know, um, made, uh, truly may have been demonic, and put them with gospel songs. Right. You know, and this is this is you know a very, you know, this is not stretching it. You know, this is not trying to make this fit. This is here. Zimri means musical. You know, Salu speaks to something being treaded down in value. You know, when you trim it or prune it, you causes it, you cause it to be treaded down in value. And when you mix it with lies of deception of, from another God, mm -hmm. because many of these musicians, they actually make packs with the devil. Yes. And then you go and take some of their music or some of their lyrics and then you put it in and mix it with uh, something that's supposed to be worshiping Yah. Yes. That's the same thing that Zimri did when he brought this Midianitish woman in the midst of the camp. Yeah. And you caused Israel to be plagued. So that's a huge lesson to learn. Amen. Huge lesson to learn. You know, and I pray we learn it. You know, verses 16 through 18, and Yahuwah spake unto Moshe, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them. For they vex you with their with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor. See, they beguiled you. They deceived you. They tricked you in the matter of Peor 
and in the matter of Colesby. They tricked you into serving their gods, and they tricked you, you know, into joining yourself with their gods via their music. Hmm. You know, the daughter of a prince. She was the daughter of a ruler of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. And you whoop your wiles is taken from Nakel, meaning deceit. You know, they vex you with deceit. And that's what they're doing now today. That's what they've been doing. That's what they're still doing. We have to be on the um, on the lookout for it. That's all I have for you. Pray with you guys.